Well, good morning, Richfield Church of Christ, and any guests who are joining us online today uh, for our sermon and our time in prayer and taking communion together. I hope that you are doing well, and I'm just so grateful that you've chosen uh, to join me today. Thank you for your time. Thank you for uh, worshiping God, for reflecting on his word and how you might live it out in your own life in obedience to Christ. Well, I want to begin today by uh, saying yesterday, uh, our church family here in Richfield uh, had a picnic together at Augsburg Park here in Richfield, and we uh, were so blessed by just great weather uh, and good food and fellowship and just a fun time together. And so uh, I just thank you uh, to Ron and Renee Dillon Martyr. They did so much of the work organizing and putting it together. And thank you uh, to everyone who participated, who was able to come out and be a part of that and uh just we hope that it was a blessing to you. Uh, and in the future, when we have these kind of gatherings, whether you're local, uh, you're a part of our church family or you're a guest, you are always welcome. And uh, we just believe that God and his love uh, has changed us and is changing us and that we are blessed when we get to share in his love with one another and share our lives together. And so we're so grateful for that time. Well, today we're going to pick up in Matthew chapter 8. Verses 1 through 17, Matthew 8, 1 through 17, uh, is where we're continuing. Now that Jesus has finished the Sermon on the Mount, and we see him coming down the mountain, this is where the story picks up. And it's uh, we've gone through these long sections of Jesus giving teaching. And in a sense, what we're looking at today is a return to some of the narrative of the things that Jesus is not only teaching, but also what is he doing as the Messiah, the anointed king who has been sent by God to reclaim his people. Now, maybe you remember this. I just want to begin by reading this back in Matthew chapter four, before the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 4, 23 to 25. Uh, Matthew gives us a description of what Jesus is doing and how the kingdom of God is coming. He says, and he went talking about Jesus. He went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, epileptics, and paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis, and from Jerusalem and Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. And this is one of the things that, that many people know about Jesus, about his life and ministry. It's not just that he taught but he is known for the many miracles of healing that he performed. And as we enter into this new section of the gospel of Matthew, uh, Matthew has organized his gospel by the inspiration of God in such a way to move from the teaching of Jesus now to the acts of Jesus in healing, in casting out demons, in caring for the down, downcast, uh, those who are um, mistreated or marginalized in society. And we get to see the reality that Jesus' teachings are lived out in what he does and how he interacts with other people. Uh, one of the commentators I read said, this is where the rubber meets the road. This is where uh, what Jesus has taught engages real life with real people. And it would be easy for somebody to critically say, oh, look, what Jesus said on the mountain. Uh, mountains are these spiritual places that really don't connect with what's going on in the valley, right? Uh, that, oh, sure, it's easy to say, love your enemies, bless those who persecute you or hurt you. It's easy to say that God cares for the poor, or God cares for the lowly in spirit, God cares for the meek, God cares for the righteous. All, all these things that Jesus has said and all these things that he has told his people to live out as a part of his kingdom. Um, this is where Jesus shows his disciples in real life that he actually not only has authority in what he teaches, but he has authority in what he does, that he is a powerful and compassionate savior who will do what is right for the good of not just Israel, but also we're going to see in this story, but that God is working through Jesus to redeem the Gentiles. The nations of the world are being brought back to God through Jesus, the Jewish Messiah. And so this text is full of good news of what God is doing and how the kingdom is coming through Jesus Christ. And what's, uh, what's fascinating is that Matthew loves to quote from the prophet Isaiah, and Matthew likes to point out uh, from a section of Isaiah known as the servant songs, the section in the later uh, half of the book of Isaiah, where uh, Isaiah the prophet talks about this servant of the Lord who God will work through to redeem Israel. And so in particular, we're going to see 
Matthew in this text quote a passage, so look for that later, that points to who Jesus is and what he is doing on behalf of Israel and on behalf of the world. And so let's begin. Let's go ahead and read our text together and hear these series of stories that have been uh, put one after the other to show us what Jesus is doing and how the kingdom is coming through his ministry of healing. When he came down from the mountain, great crowds followed him, and behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a proof to them. When he had entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And he said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion, centurion replied, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, Truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And to the centurion, Jesus said, Go, let it be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed at that very moment. And when Jesus entered Peter's house, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick with a fever. He touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she rose and began to serve him. That evening they brought to him many who were oppressed by demons, and he cast out the spirits with the word and healed all who were sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray as we begin together this morning. God, we come to you today thankful for Jesus, your son, the one who became human, fully one with us. Thank you, Father, that he uh, taught and did always what is right. Thank you that he was without sin. Thank you that he bore our uh, not only our sin, but our illness, our infirmity. And through his suffering, through his death and resurrection, we have hope of being made clean, hope of being healed of all that's wrong with us hope of life with you forever. Father, thank you for sending your Holy Spirit to dwell in your people. Thank you that this gospel that we have about Jesus is for all people, both Jew and Gentile, all who will put their trust in the Lord and become his obedient disciples. Father, uh, bless us as we listen to these stories about Jesus' authority, his healing power, his compassion, uh, his love for all people. And help us, Father, to follow him and become like him in what we do and say. Thank you for this time together in your word. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. So as we begin, and we have this series of three stories, we're going to walk through each one uh, briefly. But and just highlight what is, all, what is going on here? What are all these stories about healing about? And why are they put together in the way that they are? Why should they matter to us? And so we see that Matthew has moved from the words of the Messiah to now the deeds, the acts of the Messiah. Now, there will be teachings in chapter 8, not in Matthew, but it's going to focus on these things that Jesus is doing that represent and make us realize the kingdom, the rule of God is coming on earth as it is in heaven. And so the first person that Jesus meets uh, in the story is a leper, right? It's no coincidence that after Jesus comes down from the mountain, he's been following being followed by these great crowds, that he encounters a leper. And here's the test case for what Jesus has been teaching, right? Uh, are the poor in spirit really blessed? Uh, will mercy triumph over judgment? Is the kingdom of God really coming through the authority of Jesus? And what we know about this story, the background that you may need and I need uh, for this story to be understandable, is that for the people of Israel, cleanliness or purity uh, or holiness were important issues. Oh, well, why were they important to people like the Pharisees or the priests or the religious leaders or the everyday Israelite? Is because God in the Torah, in the Old Testament, in uh, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, had laid out laws uh, that taught the people of Israel how they were to uh, maintain their cleanness, how they were to 
uh, ritually purify themselves when they came into a state of uncleanness. Um, and all of these aspects are about how does a person enter into the presence of a holy God? And it's by becoming a holy people. And so God had given his people laws about what unclean things to try to avoid. Uh, there were certain unclean foods that Israel was not to eat or partake of. There were uh, unclean people or unclean clothes or unclean homes, places. Uh, there are a number of ways that things could be made unclean. And Israel was taught how to avoid those things or uh, how to purify themselves after they had engaged in actions that caused them to be unclean. And so God provided ways for purification. But one of the things that made people unclean is the issue of leprosy. Leprosy gets a lot of attention in the book of Leviticus. If you've ever read it, I know it's not an easy read, but you maybe noticed, wow, it talks a lot about uh, skin diseases, how to be purified, or how to avoid those with skin diseases. And so when we talk about leprosy, uh, a lot of times people think about what, what's referred to in our modern day as leprosy is Hansen's disease, right? Uh, and this would be a form of leprosy. But uh, the more common way that people would have thought about leprosy in uh, Jesus' day and time and before it was any kind of skin disease, right? So it could be something like boils or psoriasis or a rash that just won't go away. Uh, any number of forms of skin diseases would have been considered leprosy and dangerous because skin diseases are often contagious. And so what this meant for a person who was a leper is that a leper had to stay away from others. They had to make known their condition, not just by having issues with their skin, but by their appearance in general, they were to live in such a way that it reflected the disease that they had. So often a leper was someone whose hair was disheveled. They would dress in torn rags, very not very good clothes. They would live alone. They would stay away from the clean. It was They were socially banished in many ways from a religious and public life, and nobody was going to approach them or touch them, or they would avoid being touched by that person. Um, they were the embodiment of uncleanness or what it means to be untouchable in so many ways. And so when a leper entered a village, uh, according to Leviticus 13, 45 and 46, they had to announce their arrival by shouting, unclean, unclean, uh, giving a warning, saying, uh, I'm coming in. You might want to avoid me. Uh, I'm, I'm not clean. And so it was easy uh, to take a step from a person being unclean as a leper to someone thinking, well, if this person is unclean and God wants me to stay away from their uncleanness, it would be easy to think this person is condemned by God. Otherwise, they would have been made clean. God has told us to stay away from these people. Um, there were other ways a person could become unclean, but those people could become clean again through purification rites. And the only way a leper could be purified or made clean is if the disease was healed or it went away. And then the priest would look at their skin and confirm that, yes, this person has been healed. And now they can offer a sacrifice and they can go through the purification rituals to be made clean. And so all of this is fascinating because here comes this man who is a leper and he comes to Jesus. And you can imagine the crowds around Jesus <laughs> parting, getting out of the way to let this guy through to come to Jesus because they don't want to get touched. And he comes to Jesus and he um, incredibly assumes something about Jesus. He came to him, he kneels before Jesus, and he says to Jesus, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. Now, isn't that astounding that this man knows that Jesus somehow has the authority to make him clean? And Jesus does something incredible in response. We might, as readers and the people that were standing around uh, watching Jesus, would have probably wondered, what will Jesus do? Will he heal this guy? Will he send him away? Um, <laughs> and Jesus does something that I believe must have been shocking to the crowd, is that he reaches out first and he touches the man. And you just think about this, this man who has possibly had leprosy for months, years, who knows how long he's been a leper has likely not been touched by anyone for a very long time, and yet Jesus, in his mercy and compassion, touches the, the man. And he says, basically, I am willing, I will be clean. And after Jesus speaks the words, this man is healed immediately of his leprosy. He is cleansed. And what we're beginning to see 
about what Jesus has done is that Jesus, God in the flesh, holy God who's come to dwell among us, is that Jesus' cleanness, his purity, his holiness is contagious. It transfers to others. He will not become impure from being touched by others. He will not become unclean by being touched by someone else's uncleanness. He will not become unholy, but his holiness, his presence goes out to cleanse and transform others. His holiness is contagious. And Jesus invites his disciples to see what, what they will come to know is that to be holy as God is holy is to show mercy and extend his life, his love, his grace, his compassion towards others so that they might be made whole and clean through the love and grace of God. And so new life has come to this man who has been untouched for years. So we see already Jesus is the compassionate, the powerful, the authoritative, merciful Messiah who calls his disciples to show similar kinds of mercy to others. Now, this is the story's not over because what did, what did you notice Jesus did? He tells the man, here's what I want you to do is I want you to go to the temple and go to show yourself to the priests so that they can look, look over your body. They can confirm that you have been healed of your leprosy. You can offer the sacrifice that Moses commanded and go through the purification ritual that Moses commanded. And what Jesus is doing is that we're being shown again, Jesus is obedient to the Torah. Jesus has not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. And he models that for others. And what Jesus knows is by sending this man, uh, this leper, to the priests, to the temple, to be confirmed of his healing in that way, it will allow him not just to have been healed of his physical sickness, but it will allow him to have a life reestablished within his community, within his family, within his village, uh, that otherwise he might not have been able to have again. But by going through the proper channels of authority, he is restored to life again. Okay, next story, we see someone different. Jesus has loved his neighbor, his fellow Israelite. But now, amazingly, Jesus will show love to a Gentile, and not just any Gentile, but a Roman centurion, a uh, authority, a power, a leader among the Roman military that the Israelites around Jesus would have viewed as the enemy. These are the people we wish would leave, that we could be free from their oppression. And now we're going to see Jesus showing mercy and compassion to this man. So this Roman centurion came to him. We know there was a Roman uh, military presence uh, in Jerusalem and Judea, also in Galilee, in the city of Capernaum, which is on the lake of Galilee, Sea of Galilee. Uh, and so it's in this place that there would have been Roman soldiers. And a centurion was a Roman soldier who was kind of in the middle, middle of the Roman military hierarchy, is that he would have been under authority from higher ups, but he would have had others under his own authority. So a Roman centurion would have about 100 soldiers under his command, uh, and he would have been under uh, cohort commanders who would command about six groups of centuries, um, and those who commanded a legion, the legion would have consisted of 10 cohorts. So this is a man who has some authority and power in the Roman military. And he comes to Jesus, and he tells Jesus his problem. He says, Lord, which, interesting, he's going to refer to this Jewish man as Lord. Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And then Jesus either asks him a question or says to him, um, I will come and heal him. And the centurion interestingly, replies to Jesus saying, Lord, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. This is an amazing moment. A Gentile leader of the Roman military has come to a Jewish Messiah, a Jewish healer for help. And his own words, he recognizes that he, a Gentile centurion, is unworthy to have Jesus come into his home. He's unworthy to even have him lay hands on his servant, which is interesting, to touch his servant, to heal him. And he says to Jesus, I know that you have authority. I understand what it's like to have authority. He says, I can tell others to do this, do that, and they do it, come, they come, go, they go. Uh, and he understands what it means to be under authority, that there are people higher up than him who can say, do this, and he has to do it, come, and he has to come, go, and he has to go. Um, and he says to Jesus, I know that you are a man with authority. Where does Jesus' authority come, come from? It comes from God the Father who has sent Jesus into the world to bring the kingdom, is that Jesus has authority, being God in the flesh, 
and he can do all kinds of things, all things. And so somehow by faith, the centurion understands the nature of Jesus' compassion and understands the nature of his power and authority that will allow him to heal a servant, even from a distance, if Jesus just says the word. And Jesus, as he sees this man's faith, says something amazing. He says, in all of Israel, even among his own disciples, I have not found such great faith. I've not seen faith like this. And what's fascinating is that in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, there are two people described as having this kind of great faith. It's this Roman Gentile centurion, and then it'll be later in uh, chapter 15, where a Gentile woman comes to Jesus asking for healing or help for her daughter uh, to free her from the oppression of a spirit. And, um, and so Jesus is seeing in Gentiles greater faith than those who are following him from Israel. And then he begins to say, uh, something about not just what this man has done, but about what God is doing. Faith is recognizing that Jesus has authority and he is the one to be trusted in and followed. And what Jesus says is that this Roman centurion's faith is a sign of what is to come, that Gentiles will flood into the kingdom of God. They will be a part of what God is doing. He uses this language to talk about what God is going to do. He says, many will come from the east and the west to eat at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of God. And what this language was, it was from the Old Testament. It's used in the Old Testament to talk about God bringing exiles of Israel and Judah back home to be with God again. And in that, in those texts, it talks about Israel. So for example, Isaiah 43, 5 says, Yahweh comforts Israel saying, do not be afraid for I'm with you. I will bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. And so the twist in what Jesus is saying by using this verse is, is the twist is that now it's not just going to be Jews that are brought from the east and the west to sit at the table with God, but that it will be Gentiles as well of many nations. And they will sit at the Messianic feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Jesus also gives a warning that there will be many Jewish people, many people descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob who will not eat at that table that they presume that they will be saved and that they will dwell with God uh, based on their descent, based on their physical lineage. But Jesus says, no, actually, those who will make up the new family of God under Christ are those who trust in Jesus, that he is the Messiah. He is the anointed king spoken of by scripture, sent by God to deliver his people, who not only trust that he is that person, but also follow after his teachings and live their lives according to his will. And this beautiful text reminds us that this has been God's plan all along from the time when God called Abram and told him that he was going to bless him and that he would be a blessing. And God says to Abraham that through him, all peoples on earth would be blessed. When God called Israel and he told them that they were going to be a kingdom of priests and a light to the nations, they were going to mediate the presence and the blessing of God to the rest of the nations so that the nations would be drawn back into relationship with with their creator. And now in Jesus, the truth of the mission and the promises of God are all being fulfilled. The God through Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, is going to bring the nations back to Yahweh. Well, now we've seen this in the Old Testament. Maybe you remember that there were characters like um, Rahab, Ruth, Naaman, the widow of Zarephath, people who uh, experienced the blessing of entering into a covenant relationship with Yahweh. Even the Jewish people of Jesus' time were happy to allow Gentiles to become a part of Judaism if they were uh, males, if they were circumcised, and if they would keep the law, uh, the laws of the Torah, they could become part of Judaism. But now we're going to begin to see that in the kingdom of God, there will be both Jews and Gentiles, and Gentiles will become part of the family of God, not based on uh, their obedience to Torah laws like circumcision or Sabbath keeping or other aspects of or food, uh, but on their trust in and obedience to Jesus and his teachings. This was what the prophets had spoken of. The prophets had predicted that there would be a day where the nations would flow to Jerusalem in worship of the one true God. And now in Jesus, we see all of this is coming true. And this is a beautiful thing that some who were unexpected will be saved and others will experience the judgment of God, will be cast out of the kingdom into outer darkness and experience the weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so Jesus' word of uh, hope to the centurion, of good news, that you will be a part of the family of God, is also a warning to all of us uh, that 
we ought to not just assume because of who we are or because of our birth, because of our lineage, because of our descent, because of our parents' faith or anyone else's faith, that we will be with God, but that Jesus invites those who will put their trust, their faith in him and his authority and those who will follow after him, that we will be by his grace seated at the table with the people of God from out all the generations. And we will one day celebrate the good news of God's redemption of both Jew and Gentile. Okay, so in this beautiful text, we see that no longer is an enemy of Israel, this Roman centurion, but now he is a child of God. He will sit down with the great heroes of Israel's faith. He will dine at the Messianic banquet. He has great faith and a merciful reward from Jesus the Messiah. In this last section, uh, just to go over it quickly, we see Jesus returning to Peter's house in Capernaum. He comes into Peter's house, and Peter, we learn, Peter is married. Peter has a wife, uh, and his wife's mom, his mother-in-law, we're told, is sick. Jesus sees that she is sick with a fever. And Jesus goes to the mother-in-law. He touched her hand. Again, there's that touch, that compassion. And the fever left her. She rose and she began to serve. So in this beautiful text, this woman, uh, Peter's mother-in-law, we don't even know her name. I wish we knew her name. One day we will. But uh, she, after she's healed, she immediately rose and began to serve. Jesus, in his compassion, sees her need. He heals her. And <laughs> what's interesting is I often, I think about, uh, here's a person who her response to Jesus is the kind of response that that we ought to have it, because of his healing in our lives, because of the forgiveness of our sins, because the gift of his Holy Spirit coming in, uh, into us is that if we are truly grateful for what Jesus has done for us and because of our love for him and our love for others, we will rise and we will begin to serve Jesus and begin to serve others. And so this story models that for us, the kind of love that she has an appreciation for what he's done. And it's not just this woman, but we're told in summary that that evening, uh, there were many who were pressed by demons that were brought to him and he cast out the spirits with a word. He healed all who were sick. And Matthew wraps it up by saying, this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. This comes from Isaiah chapter 53, verse four. He took up our infirmities and bore our diseases. So Matthew quotes this to say, this is what God is doing through Jesus, that God is acting through Jesus to bring restoration and healing, not just to Israel, but also to the nations, is that Jesus has taken our infirmities, our sickness, our problems onto himself so that he through himself can offer healing to us. And that what God is doing is the kingdom of God is coming into the, our, our world and it is undoing all that is wrong because of sin, the curse and death. And so as we put our faith in Jesus and his authority over all things and over even sickness, we find that Jesus is a compassionate and authoritative, a loving Lord who is ready and able to heal. That Jesus is bringing about God's restoration. So when you and I read this text, what does it mean to recognize and submit to the authority of Jesus? What does it mean to call him Lord and live by that? And I believe that faith, faith is believing that Jesus is Lord. He is Lord and Savior, that he has been sent by God. He has been given by God all authority in heaven and on earth. And our response to him as the reigning king is to submit our lives and trust to him in obedience to his will, to offer ourselves for his service, knowing that he is the only one who is able to cleanse us, He's the only one able to heal us of what's wrong physically, spiritually, emotionally. All the, our sicknesses, all our infirmities can only be healed by the power of King Jesus. And he is the only one who can welcome all of us to the table of his father, who will allow those of us who are unworthy to be in his presence, unworthy to be a part of his people. By his grace, he makes us one of his own. You know, this is one of the beautiful things is that Jesus offers healing for sickness, for sin, for death. And he offers it because of his suffering on the cross and because of the power of his resurrection. Is that because Jesus took into himself everything that was wrong with us, now he can offer to us everything that is right about him. His righteousness, his holiness, his cleanness, uh, his transforming power at work in us through the Holy Spirit. Now, as you read this text, you may you may feel some pushback and you may say, well, I've been sick 
or my loved one's been sick and I've prayed and I've not actually experienced physical healing from my sickness. Others of us can look back at our story or the stories of other people and we can say, we, we prayed for God's healing and that person was healed or I was healed uh, from whatever sickness I may have had. And God, God can do that in various ways. God can heal us, answer our prayers for healing through the gift of medicine, through the gift of doctors and nurses and medical science. And that is one of the ways that God is working in the world. And for those of you who are working in medical fields, you are the tools in the hands of God. You are a blessing to people who are sick, who are hurting, who are in desperate need of healing. And God can work through you and use you to bless the world. At other times, God chooses to operate outside of uh, what we see as normal medical science. And God sometimes will supernaturally, miraculously heal people that shouldn't be healed. But at other times we know the reality is, is that um, people get sick and people die who trust in the Lord, who believe in him, who have great faith. And yet God allows them to die. And what I would encourage you to, for all of us to see in what God is doing through Jesus in his earthly ministry is that everything Jesus is doing is a sign of the kingdom that is to come. A sign of what God will do on the day of Christ's return of our resurrection from the dead and our transformation is that as Jesus goes about healing the sick, those sick people would eventually get sick again. Those sick people were still going to get old and one day die. But what Jesus is doing is a sign, right? And we, what we know is signs point us to what's coming ahead, right? So if you've ever been driven, driving on a vacation and you're heading to some well-known site, you know that a lot of times there are signs along the way. You know, there five miles to whatever incredible thing that you're wanting to see on your vacation, right? We understand that signs uh, point us in the direction of what we're going to see in the fullness. And we, we know you could look at the sign and you could say, wow, that sign's exciting. That picture looks really good. Um, you know, we don't really need to go any further. I've seen the picture, right? Uh, and, and we would laugh and say, no, that's just the sign. The thing that is really exciting is coming. And in truth, these healings of Jesus are signs of what's coming, of what God will do when the kingdom comes in its fullness on earth as in heaven, is that there will be a day for those who have put their trust in Jesus as Lord. There is coming a day when he will raise up our bodies and change them to be like his glorious body. And on that day, those who are in the Lord and have put their trust in him, we will experience life without end that we will have resurrected bodies that will never get sick again, that will never be tempted to sin again. Sin and death will be no more, and we will dwell with God forever. And so what Jesus is doing is pointing us to what's coming, what's coming. And, and it, it ought to give us great hope, great hope in what God is doing. And you know what? Uh, if we experience healing in this life from whatever sickness you may have, uh, we can say, praise God. Thank you, God. I I am just so thankful, and I'm going to use this as an opportunity to tell others about your goodness and about the hope that we have in Jesus as our great and compassionate healer, the great physician. But on the other hand, if you don't experience healing in this lifetime, it's not a reason to give up your faith in Christ Jesus, because you can say, I may not be healed of this right now. I may die, but I know that the Lord who's risen from the dead will one day come and raise me up and change me. My healing is coming. It may not be here yet, but my healing is coming on the day of Christ's return. And it's in that reality we put our hope is that Jesus will raise us up from the dead. Sin and death will be no more, and we will live and reign with God forever. And so I invite you, I invite us like these characters to come into the presence of the Lord today putting our trust in Jesus, that he's the one with authority and power to forgive our sins, to cleanse us from what makes us unclean, to heal us of all that is wrong, and to change us to be like him. And we recognize that we are not worthy of his love, his compassion. We know in every single one of our hearts that we have done wrong, that we have sinned, that we have hated, that we have lusted, that we have hurt others, that we are in every way, we are sick. And Jesus is the cure. He is the one who can heal us and forgive us and change us by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so when we come to the table this morning, we come as the people who are humbled by the reality that we are unworthy to enter into the presence of our Lord. But by his grace, he has invited us to eat at table with him. And when we eat this table, when we eat the bread and we drink the cup, we remember what he's done, but we also will do it pointing toward the day of his return. 
the Lord's Supper in, in some ways functions as a sign of what's to come. That when we eat the bread and drink the cup, we are looking forward to that day when we will sit at the Messianic banquet table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and this Roman centurion, and all the people of faith who've gone before us trusting in the Lord. And we will eat and we will celebrate what God has done to save us. And because of that grace, we give thanks. Let's pray together, take the bread and drink the cup. God, we thank you for Jesus, our Lord, who gave his body on the cross for our sins. Thank you, Father, that he is the one who is offering us healing through his suffering. Lord, help us to bow our lives before him, to trust in his saving grace, to give thanks for his life, his death, and his resurrection, and his promise to come again. Bless us now as we break bread. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Pray with me for the cup. God, we thank you for the Lord Jesus who shed his precious blood on the cross for our sins. Thank you for this precious gift. Father, we are unworthy of your love, but we thank you that you've made us children of God by our trust in the Lord Jesus. Help us to live in obedience to his word. Help us, Father, to not only seek the healing that only he can provide, but help us to be sources of healing in the lives and the relationships with people around us. Help us to be uh, Christian servants who rise and bless others uh, through what you have given us, Lord. Thank you now that we drink the cup together as your people. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Let me say thank you so much for being with me today. I pray that as you go out, as you worship, as you serve the Lord, as you spend time with your family and your friends and in your work, remember that Jesus has borne your sins. He has borne your iniquities. He has borne our infirmities, all that is wrong with us. And he is the one offering us healing and new life. And we get to go out into the world and we get to be the people who say to others, healing is available. The cure is here. Jesus is the one the compassionate and loving God who offers us new life through his death and resurrection. And this is good news for all of us. We love you. God bless you. Thank you for being with me today.